Welcome to Spotlight. My name is Nuong Falong. The 2020 elections came with some keenly contested seats. Of course, with this keen competition came some surprise losses and unexpected wins. Among such keenly competitive seats was the Medina constituency, which was contested by political colleagues Alhaji Boniface Abubakar Siddiq, Honorable and newcomer, or not so new, uh, Francis Xavier Sosu. Surprisingly, uh, newcomer Francis Xavier Sosu is the present member of parliament elect of the Medina constituency. We are catching up with him today on Spotlight to discuss the politics around Medina and what his expectations are going into parliament. We'll go for a quick break, and when we come back, we introduce to you Francis Xavier Susu. Welcome back to Spotlight. You're watching MX24, your home for fun, fearless, and factual content. Before the break, I did mention that we have Member of Parliament-elect of the Medina constituency, Francis Xavier Sosu, who is a lawyer and a human rights activist. He also has uh, other successes under his belt, which he'll be explaining to us. Welcome to Spotlight. Thank you. So good to be here today. It's good of you to um, honor our invitation. How do you pronounce your name? There are times I have thought it should be pronounced Francis Javier Sosu, mm -hmm. uh, but it's commonly Francis Xavier Sosu. That's what it, most people call you. It. Which pronunciation is the correct one? Well, um, there is no absolute correct pronunciation. Right. It depends on. Um, uh, maybe people's culture, their background, mm. as well as jurisdiction. Actually, in most English jurisdiction, it's called Xavier. But in Francophone jurisdiction, it's Javier. Yes. And then, you know, some Spanish will also call it Javier. Yeah. So it depends on who uh, is but pronouncing. But you know, um, you're actually named after a saint. That is correct. Saint this Francis saint, Xavier. his origins are Spanish. That is correct. So that's why typically I, I usually lead towards Javier. Yeah. Does this in any way impact your life, being named after a saint? Um, do you have any connection with the saint? Do you? Well, I, I think the, the connection is more of a, uh, a spiritual connection with God um, through Jesus Christ, uh, Simplicita. And of course, uh, having a Catholic background, um, starting my very early um, religious life at the St. Paul's Catholic Church, where I had my first baptism, first communion, confirmation, as well as um, attended a Life in the Spirit seminar, Growth in the Spirit seminar, did Cospol, and, and all these things. I'm sure that if um, uh, Monsignor uh, Father uh, Adoboli is watching, uh, I know that uh, he was one of my very early spiritual fathers in life and was guiding me. Uh, perhaps the only thing I didn't focus to do was becoming a priest because I, at a point, was almost becoming even a Eucharistic minister wow. at St. Paul's Catholic Church. So, um, yeah, I mean, and that's where, uh, when I was baptized, I was named Francis. Uh, and in researching Francis and looking at uh, the Francises and those who are, uh, I would call a patron saint, mm -hmm. uh, I came by Francis uh, Xavier. But you're not Catholic. Um, once a Catholic, always a Catholic, right. and that mm -hmm. is a universal church that we all belong to. Um, I believe that uh, in Christendom, um, we have the universal church, which is the true body of Christ, and it is a spiritual church, uh, and it's a spiritual body. It's not a physical body. I think sometimes we get so worked out on 
which denomination do you belong in? Anybody is struggling to know where do you belong, where do you mm. not belong? Mm. But I believe that uh, we have the Church Universal, um, and the entry requirement is very simple, uh, faith in Jesus Christ, believing, receiving the message, believing, being baptized for the remission of your sins. You sound very religious. Sealed with the Spirit of God, <laughs> and then God himself adds you. So it doesn't matter where you find yourself. Once you profess to be a Christian and you act like Christian, I treat you as a Christian and as a brother. And so, yeah, I, I most of my life have been uh, a churchy life. And that's I come uh, today. I still work as an associate pastor uh, at the Living Streams Church of I Christ. See. So, um, yeah, pastor I've had, Francis. <clears throat> well, lawyer, pastor, politician. Uh, um, you're wearing a, a lot of positions under your belt? Well, it's because I see them as not mutually exclusive. I believe that they complement each other. I don't think that okay. you can be... So you uh, don't find yourself pressed for time to attend? Not to at all. I mean, I, I do church um, and I preach when I'm available. I join, for example, tomorrow we're going to do street evangelism. I'll be there because main election is over. Now we have to go straight to campaign for Christ. Mm. Um, so you finished the political are, campaign and now you're on the yeah, spiritual campaign. campaign. You know, so the point is that they are not mutually. I believe that in, whilst in parliament, uh, I should be able to positively impact decisions and values and mm. people's lives because of my training as a Christian and somebody who want to live by the values of Christ. So being compassionate, being moderate, not to uh, overly partisan, mm. not um, uh, having allegiance to the code of arms. How, how do you avoid being overly partisan when? No, no. You, I, I you think are... that it's a it's a state that we must eventually reach. Mm. We are not there yet. We are now very much deep divided on partisan lines, but like Mahatma Gandhi says, be the change you want to see in society. Mm -hmm. uh, the change I want to see, I want to see a new Ghana. Uh, a Ghana where people are judged not by political colors. A Ghana where businesses um, have opportunities not because of political connections. A Ghana where um, children are free to say that I am an MPP or an NDC and they would not be victimized by their colleagues. Mm. A Ghana where people would have freedom of choice, express those freedoms, and they will still feel confident about freedom themselves. Freedom of association, association freedom of choice, and they will, and they will be around. Anyway. You know, so I think that these are ideals that we need to ascribe, to, I mean, we need to subscribe to and aspire to. Unfortunately, we are not there yet. But being somebody who believes in the change and believes in the future of this Ghana I'm looking forward to, I believe that I should begin to lead the way. Mm. And that is how come I believe that not being overly partisan is going to be something I will aspire to and I will encourage as many people as possible to aspire to those values. Let me reverse you a little bit. Yes. Uh, a lot of people found out about you, first found out about you, during your case that you took up for Francis Ejari. That is true. Um, tell, tell us about the events surrounding the case, uh, how it impacted you. Well, Francis Ejari was put on remand for 14 years without trial and was released to the Justice for All program. And uh, because he felt he was innocent and kept him on remand for 14 years, he became very, very desperate, looking for assistance to fight for justice. When he was not getting assistance, he decided to commit suicide. And um, according to him, he listened to radio where a suicide program was being held, where people were being counseled out of that, and he attended the program. It was at that program that he met Sarah of Refrie of Metro TV at the time, who ran a story on him. Mm. And the then uh, Sarah and I think the editor called and said, can you assist us? And I said, why not? And I recall they came to my office and he actually knelt down begging that. And you took the case pro bono? Yeah, I mean, he begged that he just go do the case for me. And uh, you can, when we eventually get justice, you can keep 50%, then I'll take 50%. I said, I mean, we don't do it like that you can sign a contract, which he signed, for 25%. And this is a case we are going to follow up, which I did for like four mm. years mm. before mm. we had judgment, payment for everything from beginning to the end. 
And unfortunately, I think when judge, when we had judgment and money was about to be paid, then um, he basically turned his back on, on me and um, said he was not going to pay. And I suspected because there were people who were influencing him. That's why mm. he paid 25%. Mm. Every lawyer pays 10% or 5%. But obviously, they didn't know the circumstances surrounding the but case. But this same man turned around to accuse you of cheating him. Well, I mean, and that is how it is. In fact, it's, I recall that he said he was not going to pay. And I said he should keep the money. Mm. And he went and out of his own volition, because I stopped following the case, actually. Um, then, but it was after we finished the money, they were just processing to pay him. So when we didn't follow, it didn't stop the payment. Mm -hmm. So Attorney General went ahead and paid him. So I think out of his own volition, he went and paid uh, part of our legal fee into my account. Three months after paying that legal fee, he went to the General Legal Council and said I had overcharged him for professional fees. Uh, and that was part of the reasons why eventually I had to lose my license at a point in time. Yes, as a lawyer. To, I'll get to that. But <laughs> this whole situation, <coughs> yeah. did it uh, negatively impact your, uh, let's say, your activist side? It, because it, you do a lot of yeah, activism. It, it shocked me. I was surprised that he could do that. But then again, I also understood that. <coughs> Sorry, once you set out um, to fight injustice, definitely at a point in time, you would also be, must be a testimony of the system. Did you regret taking the case? I didn't. I never regretted, not once, taking that case. And even when, whilst I was on suspension as a result of, uh, I mean, that case and, of course, some other, and which was the yeah. um, uh, billboard matter, which mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. council accused me of, advertising myself on and they suspended you for three years on facebook <laughs> the, the suspension was supposed to be lifted uh, if it had gone into full effect 2021 this year. it would have been 2021, 2021. yeah uh, right yeah so but of course like i said those of us who uh, i mean the v out there know that truth stands you know integrity also stands it doesn't matter i mean every integrity will be subjected to test have you ever been faced with uh, a situation and then you thought about what you have to go through, and then you say, I'm not going to take this case. Uh, no. Uh, every single point in time, I look at the justice of the case. In mm -hmm. fact, my personal motto is justice for all, injustice to none. I see. So as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't really matter who is involved. So long as I believe that some form of injustice has been perpetrated, and I believe that following that case or, I mean, reaching out to that person may help other people in mm. similar conditions. I always volunteer to do that. And as much as it is possible, we do it for free. Those that come out with eventual compensation, there are ways that those who receive those compensation compensate us back. For example, mm. there was a case of two police officers I was doing. It took me eight years to do that case. They didn't pay anything. But eventually when they were paid, some of them came back and they paid part of that as mm. legal fees, mm. you know. So, um, so long as there is a need, you, you go ahead and, is, and, solve the, and assist the person. For example, one of those cases, and way after Francis Ejari, we had another Francis Asante. Mm. And Francis Asante was accused of uh, defilement and was jailed for 15 years. And when I took up that matter at the Supreme Court and he was acquitted and discharged, he that, that ruling came at a time he has already been in prison for 15 years mm. you see so his life has been destroyed but nobody paid anything for that but i did that case until he was acquitted he, and discharged he, and many more like that felix nyaba who was a journalist was wrongfully convicted mm -hmm. uh, there were cases of as for the justice for all program where i've represented several hundreds of people and perhaps traveled to almost every prison in ghana you know, trying to reach out and you, assist You do people. a lot of philanthropic work. You know. Uh, a lot of, some get, you know, some eventually come with some payment, mm. but it takes a long time. Mm. Mm. Some come with no payment. Doesn't this leave you broke? So you're spending a lot mostly, of time. Yeah, mostly it does. Mostly it does, but uh, I see it as investment into those people. I, I believe, personally, I believe that service of others is service of self. Mm. I believe that in serving others, you serve yourself. 
it's only with time. For example, when you look at the overwhelming endorsement I had in Medina, I don't think it's just because I have some extra magic wand doing anything in Medina. Mm, mm. But I believe that many people connected with my act of service. They connected with my compassion. Mm. They connected with my humanness, mm. uh, my, my, my desire to be available to serve and help other people. And I think they connected with that. And that is why I cannot fail the people of Medina. Whatever they've seen in me as a human rights and public interest lawyer, I, I want them to see that in my parliamentary work in the way I connect with them on the ground, in the kind of policies I implement, in the ways I implement those policies without discrimination. I want them to see those things in me and I want them to see them in Medina. And that is my uh, preoccupation right now. Uh, so when you're moving into politics, mm. how are you going to divide your time between philanthropy and politics? Most politicians, uh, especially at, at all of us people go into politics for the mm. money mm. what's in it for you um, maybe service in fact the reason why I've served notice not that, money not at all I don't think politics will give me money I think that politics will rather take a lot of my money mm. uh, and I'm willing to do that it will take a lot of my not even money I'll let me say a lot of my resources because I'm putting a lot of my legal practice expertise at the expense of mm. politics, it's part mm. of it. For example, recently 30 of our protesters were arrested. You, you, you don't beg anybody for money to go represent such protesters. And many more people who have run into one problem or the other with the law, either on a political line or social line or whether they are mere activists, um, I make myself available to assist as much as I can. Um, I believe that and I've always told people who are very loyal to me mm. that, look, get up and work. You see, as I'm here with you today, this afternoon, um, we are barely two weeks into uh, uh, my election as a member of parliament. Mm -hmm. But I probably might have done more than 10 cases within those two weeks. Only today I did three cases. One at the, Supreme, uh, at the Court of Appeal, one at the uh, District Court, and one at the High Court. <laughs> so, you see, so the point is that Politics is a platform of service. Right. Your career is what guarantees your economic uh, power, your economic strength. So my law, my work, my businesses, private businesses, these are the things I believe will get me resources, but not politics. Talking about these protesters that you're presenting, there are some people who have the opinion that they actually deserve to be arrested because they were disturbing the peace. Well... I mean, as for arrests, the basis for arrests are prescribed by law. And you can arrest if, I mean, your arrest could be lawful, which is fine. But everybody you arrest also has a right, even as a suspect, and has a right to be heard before a court. Mm. Um, I believe that these protesters are independent individual Ghanaians who mm. feel cheated by the system mm. and who are protesting. Um, the best way to respond to these protesters is not simply arresting them and throwing them to prison. Because if you arrest one, there are a million others who are out there mm. who are crying that they've been cheated. The best way is to listen to the basis of the protest, which I believe that the flag bearer of the NDC has made amply clear the reason and the basis for rejecting the presidential mm. election. Mm. And I know many people are out there protesting because of the rejection of the presidential results. And reasons have been preferred. So I'm hoping that these reasons will rather be um, heard and something done about it. If that happens, I'm very confident that this multiple protest would cease. If it doesn't, I am looking forward to a nationwide political you know, protest. Let us not. Are you, are you let not us, encouraging? No, you see, no protest is legal. And a lot of people have said that. In fact, most NDC people are inciting the public. No, 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 no. It's very legal to protest. You see, the reason is that, you see, we, we all sit here and sometimes we pretend. When we were growing up, they said, "Yen ara ya sasini, e abo din din maye, moja na 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 nu shegu nyadi tu homaye, 
a drumi ne won so so. You didn't tell me you were also a singer. Say ye be at one so so. This is our time okay. to follow the path of our forebears. And you know what? It took multiple protests. How did we get the big six? People keep saying that the, the court is available. Why are you How on the streets we, protesting? During, I mean, when, when we had the big six, we had courts in Ghana. Go look at the counties and the various courts. The common, uh, the common law courts that were in existence the, that at the time uh, uh, the, of, of those political protests. Protests are legitimate. Sometimes there are certain political actions that requires necessary protests. What about when these protests disturb the peace of uh, that regular is, So that is where the conversation can move to. So I will use the platform to encourage fellow comrades that one, you have all the right to protest, but let the protest be within the limit of the law. Mm. One, you would need to give the police notice under the Public Order Act, at least five clear this notice under the Public Order Act. So let's say police notice that we want to go out there and protest. So that is fair, so that they can be available to assist to prevent the breach of the peace. Mm. Secondly, I would also beg that in as much as we need to protest, let the protest be peaceful. So you don't need a have violent. Have you had a chance to advise these protesters? You don't, you, don't, you don't need a violent protest to make a case. Mm. So uh, we, we keep advising, and that's why I'm using this platform. Mm. And I know that this, I mean, a very uh, well listened to platform and very well watched uh, station. And I'm, I believe that a lot of our comrades both from Medina and all those who have loved and followed Sosu by now are following. And I mm -hmm. know that we should try and make our protest um, devoid of uh, uh, violence. And, and as far as the protest is concerned, we are not going to... I, I'm looking forward to a day when His Excellency John Daman Mama will say that all the over 6 million Ghanaians who voted for me, let us all hit the streets and let's protest. And we serve the police notice and then we hit the streets. Wouldn't that completely well, disrupt the peace? Well, uh, how why should it disrupt the peace? We just locked down Ghana. And after locking down Ghana, I'm sure that everybody will wake up to the reality. Because, you see, what, what is happening here is that we have a systemic fraud perpetrated by the Electoral Commission. Where the, and, the, where's the evidence? Oh, well, we, we've supplied several evidence uh, to that. I mean, we've talked about padded uh, I mean, results. And if you even put all the padded results together, there is the, the, the president will still not get 50 plus one. If you put all those padded results together, the president will not still get 50 plus one. And you know, let Ghanaians wake up. Look, last four years by this time, the current government had 63 members of parliament more than the National Democratic Congress. So it is not for nothing that as we speak now, according to the EC certified results, is 137, 137. Even then, we are contesting about five of the seats that have been declared for them because we have realized that it wasn't declared lawfully and that's why we are asking for recollation and a number of things. Mm. So Ghanaians must realize that Ghanaians indeed voted for change. But the question is, would Ghanaians have the change they voted for? Mm. That is a multi-million question that will not be answered by the political actors of today. It will not be answered by the political uh, uh, ruling class of today. It will not be answered by the EC. It would only be answered by the demands of the people who voted for the change. Let's go to Medina constituency. Mm. Uh, you won. Uh, you're not a member of parliament elect of Medina constituency. This is very surprising to a lot of people, um, especially the margin between you and the incumbent. How did you do it? That's a question a lot of people want to ask. Well, um, if you really want to know the secret, the first one is um, faith in Christ through um, um, your belief in his holy word and uh, also uh, believe in God and trust in God. You know, um, I have realized that it is so sweet to trust in <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> just to hold him by his words, just to rest 
upon his promise just to say that says the Lord. Are you a choir star? Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, how I trust thee. How I've proved thee more and more. So you Jesus, through Jesus. Jesus. Well, that is, it, it's so key. And that's how come I take time to express it. You know, I prove him over and over and over and over again to prove that he has never failed me yet. Mm. And so that is the number one secret. The second secret is remaining humble and being with the people. You see, the Bible says that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. If you can humble yourself and connect to the ground and connect to the base, you listen to the ground and you fashion messages that, that connect with the ground. Uh, that is real and people, people will believe it and they'll give you the opportunity. Mm. And that's what I did. Um, I began the Madina journey as far back as 2012. Um, somewhere in 20, uh, 2013, I was having Center for Poverty Alleviation at the Madina Zungo. Mm. We had a Zungo development platform. With all these things, we were providing jobs and training and skills for young women and men in and around Madina Zungo. Um, I contested, so you knew then that you wanted I to be I contested in 2015 with the then MP, Onabwa Marisurugu, and I lost to him in a very contentious battle. And I did not relent. I kept working with the base and came back in 2019 where I won the primaries to now contest with Honorable Madu, uh, Honorable Boniface, Boniface Abubakar. Um, I entered into that contest trusting God and working on the ground. Mm. I walked everywhere I needed to walk to, uh, connected with everyone I needed to connect to. We did listening tour where I got to know of the basic problems around. Mm. Mm. One of which is job jobs. I mean, our young guys, you have a lot of it's young people problem. and they don't have jobs. So um, you can say that you build AstroTech, but they don't have jobs. Mm. You can say that you build roads, but they don't have jobs and they are, they are crying. So one of the major things I have sought to do, which I, I discussed with them and they bought that idea, was to establish what I call the Madina Job Center. As I talk to you now, anyone can go to www.madinajobcenter.com. And you realize that we already have the job center up there. Mm. So far, we have over 400 people who have applied through our job center. Uh, we have somewhere around 50 people so far who we have actually retooled and they're already learning trade. Some we've given mm. ovens to start. Some is this giving... only blue color or a mixture? No, 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 no. It's a mixture. So, in fact, the job center is actually also becoming like a job agency, mm. such that if you have your degree or your diploma, you can apply to them and you can do something. Um, we are already connecting with industry in Medina, in mm. and around Medina. Mm. Uh, mm. We are hoping to sign an MOU with them that allows them to recruit through our job center in Medina. Mm. As it stands now, there are many companies in Medina, and we have people traveling from all over the country to work in Medina and go back whilst we have a lot of our young people who don't have any job at all. So as a friendly overture to the community, as you can call it corporate social responsibility, uh, the member of parliament is providing an opportunity for you to connect and let's build people. You see, because economic empowerment is so key. That's, that's, that is the heart of human development. And that's what I'm interested in. And the people bought those ideas. We have sports development, we have educational, uh, projects that we have, we have uh, social intervention and all kinds of uh, uh, sports. Uh, you know, we have the health programs which we are bringing in terms of mobile clinics that I'm introducing. So these are things that connect with the people at the base, mm. and that's how come a lot of them came out to vote for me. I want you to hold on to that trail, and we'll come back to it. If you just joined us, you're watching Spotlight on MX24. I am Nuong Falong. We are speaking to Member of Parliament-elect of the Madina constituency, Honorable Francis Xavier Sosu. He also delighted us <laughs> with some music. We are touching presently on the politics in the Madina constituency, especially questions surrounding his win. We just made slight inroads. We'll be right back to the same subject. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Spotlight on MX24. We're talking with MP elect of Medina, lawyer Francis Xavier Sosu, who is also a human rights activist. And he was, we have questions, and he was giving us answers to those questions. Lawyer Francis, yes. uh, you were talking about your win in mm. Medina, and you gave us some insight into why you won, mm. how you won, how mm. you did it. Uh, I was watching the declaration when you were won. I, I mean, you know, journalists were on YouTube 24 hours, yeah. our eyes were glued to different screens. Yeah. Uh, I saw exactly when you were declared, mm. you were sitting down very calmly. Uh, some people were pouring powder on you. Mm. You went out into the, the pickup mm. uh, truck, you were standing up. You were very calm. I remember one of my colleagues was like, he doesn't know how to dance or he's not dancing. Were you surprised? You looked, uh, you were too calm. In, in the whole situation, yeah. were you surprised by your win? Um, I, I was confident of winning. Uh, however, the declaration humbled me. Mm. It, it humbled me because um, this is a journey that I began as far back as 2012, um, and suddenly it's like... Um, it's coming to fruition. It, it just came to pass. So even in the car, I kept asking my colleagues, is that what there is to so it means I'm an MP elect? Is that, is that what it means or final battle? Is there is there <laughs> going to be something else that that mm -hmm. everybody was like you are you you are the next MP of Medina, and so um, I think that's my natural demeanor. Mm -hmm. I I love to party. I love to dance. I love to have a lot of fun. And throughout our campaigning, I I was dancing everywhere. Mm. Yes, um, I saw you make a few moves. Yeah, I mean, I would share a few of our videos with you, mm -hmm. but they are just a lot of fun dancing around. But that very day was a more, it's a very humbling day mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. I felt the burden of leadership and I started thinking about how to meet the aspiration of all these people. It's good that you feel I, the burden because at least you recognize some responsibility. Yeah, I recall that when we're driving out of the place, we drove all the way through the Medina Chief's Palace mm. and drove through the market. And I saw, I mean, I visibly saw Kayaye mm. with their pants cheering and screaming. Oh. And you see these women sing, I mean, breathing a sigh of hope or believing that uh, this young man can bring about some change or something. We've heard that he helps many people. We, we are just hoping that he will be able to help us. So for me, um, it, it kind of humbled me. Francis, there's a lot yeah. of expectation on you. There is. Especially when you say, you know, these people are all looking forward. Yes. There's a lot of hope. People have their yes. eyes on you. People are expecting yes. miracles. And but they you are, you're they not are, a saint. Well, you see, but their hope would not be disappointed. You see, because the expectations of the righteous shall not be cut. Uh, that's what my Bible tells me. And is it not a huge burden, the expectation? The expectation is big. It will always be big. However, you see, God gives us what we can take at every given point in time. Mm. And I believe that I'm so cut out for this job. And um, just as the declaration shocked many people, so will the announcement of my work in Medina. Shock I mean, people. Huh? Yeah, it will shock people. You know, so because I... Are there specifics that you, you have oh, in the yes, works? No, absolutely. I, uh, at this stage, I mean, I always try uh, not to behave like a keen promise. Mm. I want to make sure that um, I'm a pragmatist. And, king Promise will uh, not be happy with you. Do we? I don't even know There's who is a, a King Promise. Is a king promise. Oh, well, we don't <laughs> apologize, keep promise. <laughs> well, in our political parlance, we've been getting some keen promises in Ghana too. Moving on. Well, Mo moving on. You know, Go so ahead, the point is that um, I believe that let the reality speak for itself. Right. Many people ask me, but at what margin are you going to beat Bonifi? I'm like, I mean, what I know is I'm going to win. And it's going, the margin will be a shocking margin. Mm -hmm. You know, many people did not believe it because they kept saying that uh, the Sorogo gave him, like, uh, we had 8,000 deficit. He came, closed the 8,000 and mm -hmm. added 9,000 extra. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to 
over 10, 17,000 vote deficit. Mm. But mm. not but you, only did we over, over 10, 000. yeah, actually we over 10 to 15,000, we over 10 to 17,000, added 15, more than 15,000 mm. extra. Mm. Mm. So it tells you that, um, say, only friend is say, over to a boa boa, which is a nice BBC. In, you, in other words, when the blind says, uh, I will. Throw you, throw, I'll a stone throw a stone at, at you. you. It means that uh, he's it's already stone right, right on his feet. Yes. So I'm, I'm so confident that the people of Madina will be proud they voted for lawyer Susu at this time. Lawyer Susu. Yes, ma'am. There's one person who's not happy about your win. At least one person we know. Okay. Uh, there may be others, but this one we clearly know. He is surprised about your win. He is contesting the validity of your win, and that's honourable. Boniface Siddiq, uh, incumbent member of parliament of the Medina constituency, he does not accept your win. What, what do you, what do you think? Oh. He thinks there was some foul play. Was there foul play? How is that possible? I mean, ahead of the election, we made it very clear that I don't want to be declared a winner of a flawed election. I don't want to cheat anybody. I'm not interested in extra ballot paper or ballot box or anything. What I will not stand uh, to, um, uh, to happen to me or what I will not allow happen to me mm. is to allow the system to cheat me. That one I will not agree. Uh -huh. So where I will position my people and everybody will open their eyes to make sure that what is there is what is there was what I did. And truthfully, uh, or truthfully uh, on the day of election, we collated our own, we did our own collation center. And we had all our pink sheets mm. collated. In fact, the figure I had, that was exactly what the EC had. And that's the reason why we believe that his excellency John Dawani Mahama won this election. Because see, we collated and transmitted. We're, we're here to, to get the proof <laughs> well, of all of that. Well, but, but when you have a systemic fraud, it's difficult. Lord but Francis, we will eventually get there. Uh, Honorable Alaji Boniface says he's going to contest the results. Oh, I think that he's backtracked. Are you worried? No, he's backtracked on that long ago. I've, I've heard him grant interview on other platform where he says that he's no more interested in contesting. Um, I mean, you know, um, it's, you should understand. You see, that's how God has arranged it. The old order will always have to give way for the new, except that that change doesn't come easily. Honorable Abu Bakr Boniface is like a father to me. He is a very experienced politician. He's, um, he unseated Surugu. Yeah, I mean, and he, he himself has always said that, I mean, if he, I mean, unseated Surugu, I mean, how can me, a schoolboy? In fact, when, I, when know, I interviewed him, um, uh, that was one of his responses. Mm. If he could unseat Surugu, who was a serious uh, uh, veteran, mm -hmm. uh, how, mm -hmm. how did, do you think you can uh, unseat uh, You know, him? exactly. And I made it very clear that this battle was uh, a battle of David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. And I'm working Just like with his battle with Sorogo. Exactly. So you sometimes know. actually liking your defeat of him to his defeat of uh, Sorogo. Did you learn anything from his defeat of Sorogo that you applied well, to this win? Well, I mean, the, one of the reasons why Sorogo lost was really because at the time, a lot of people in Madina bought into the lies that they brought because they actually believed that... Whose well, lies? Oh, I mean, like the ruling government's lies. Uh, they believed that they were going to be giving us $1 million every year. And that wasn't going to happen. They believed they was going to build some factory in Medina. It didn't happen. And then coupled with that, we had our own some challenges, you know, internal challenges as at the time, you know, because of the way that our primaries went and so on and so forth. So he took advantage of that and said, oh, you know what? Oh, you can go ahead and vote for John Mahama. You can vote for me and manage to lure a lot of our people, you know, mm. into following him. And that's how come he had that win. Not really because... Uh, he had any uh, superior ideas as to how Madina should be. And truthfully, since he came to Madina, if I'm lying, he can show one single policy that he implemented. There was none. Particularly when it comes to job creation, uh, you come to um, like opportunity for uh, women, for example, in the market, nothing. You know, so uh, the point he is that... He himself on educational accomplishments. Oh, well, um, I... Uh, some employment, you know. Um, well, you see, those things were just paperwork. On the ground, there was nothing there. I mean, people, mm. 
you know, we connect with the ground. Everywhere you go, they will tell you that. Are you saying it's because you're his opponent? No. I mean, I, I love him as a person because he has a very good persona and mm. a good personality, mm. you know. Have you been able to meet separately Not since? after the elections, but before the election, we used to meet at various functions. And we've always been nice to one another. Both of us are not violent. Um, both of us are not, I mean, insulting in our mm. political language. So I think we have some good things in common, mm. except that, um, I mean, I believe that I am um, uh, the new aspiration that many people uh, want to ascribe to, and I represent the future mm -hmm. that people want to see for Medina. And so my coming uh, is for jobs for the young people, um, and they should look forward to it. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to lobby to uh, resolve some of our infrastructural deficits that we have. But most importantly, I will be a very effective member of parliament, uh, providing them with very quality representation in parliament. Security is a big problem in Medina. What is your plan? Well, um, it didn't used to be a big problem. I think it's only in the last four years. I don't know how things degenerated so fast in Medina. How will you tackle it? Um, uh, you know, security has always been the responsibility of the Municipal Security Council. Um, so, um, we, I hope that as a member of the Assembly now, I will be able to bring my influence on the Assembly and the Ghana Police Service um, to increase their activities in Medina. Mm. We need to increase police patrol. Mm. We need to increase uh, police posts in various communities because Madina has become so huge and large. You know, um, now even the voting population is about over 150,000. Mm. And guess what? Um, those who didn't vote may probably be more. Mm. Yes. Mm. You know, so that is why it is important that uh, we need to you know, have a conversation around increasing uh, policing in Medina because they, as, they assist with the mandate of uh, security, safety, so from the aspect and of so prevention. on. Exactly. And we may probably also be working on potential watchdogs mm. committees because uh, it's worked in the past uh, where you work with the local police to get young men who are around to look out for one another in the community to avoid uh, issues of um, maybe mm. theft mm. And, and so on and so forth. You, know? you are going to be a, a new entrant in parliament. Uh, a lot of people will call you a greenhorn. Mm. Uh, parliament has in the last year or more, a lot of people have bemoaned the high attrition rate. Mm. There are worries new people coming in with no knowledge, no experience and dragging back the work of Parliament. How are you going to be useful to Parliament? Well, I think that um, the argument of dragging back the work of Parliament, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is neither here nor there because a Parliament is an institution um, and it's a house of records. Um, what you need to do is allow yourself to be schooled. Uh, definitely, uh, as a new entrant, I know we are going to be having orientation. Um, the smartest thing to do is to make sure you get a political mentor uh, who I have spotted already. Who, who, who is? Uh, I will not mention the is name it a of minority her. minority leader? I will not mention the name or of her. Or majority her. leader? I will not mention the name of <laughs> her. Who, have you spoken who, to your mentor? Who I have. What's his I've name? I've already been given even the parliament uh, standing orders. Is he in the minority I or am, the majority? Which I'm studying <laughs> and, and already positioning myself to be effective on the floor of parliament. Is he a parliament. minister? Um, I think uh, he's a, a great person. Okay. He, he's, he's been a great uh, parliamentarian over the years. He's served for several what? attempts. And, and I believe that Give us an his, example of his, leadership, his, leadership, <laughs> <laughs> his leadership is definitely going to make me. Because, you see, once you allow yourself to be schooled, you never miss out on chances and opportunities. Is it's people, I address you, your mentor? It's people... He's one of my mentors. He's, he's a great guy and he's one of my mentors. He definitely is one of them. Um, so, you know, there are people that I look up to. I mean, they, 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 they inspire me in politics. And these are people who are willing to impact and I am willing.
to learn. I'm not in a hurry at all. Do, do, you talk a lot about change. Do you intend to propose any bills in Parliament? Absolutely. Um, I want to be able to introduce private members' bill, uh, particularly on victim support. Uh, it's one of the things that uh, is on my heart because I've done just too many cases where I've seen victims left with no support whatsoever. Mm, mm, mm. So I believe that if we have one piece of legislation that properly details the state obligation towards a victim of crime and perhaps even the assailant's obligation mm. towards the victim and these are clearly spelled out and actionable in court I believe that it, gives uh, it, would, it would yes definitely give them some leverage Do you have and then I also I also believe that we should be thinking also about human rights act right. you know it's not enough to have uh, the bills in our constitution we need to reduce them into an act of parliament where we now even detail mm. you know mm. issues of human rights you know um, that people can you know speak to and people can easily mm. access mm. Mm. you can assemble all the rights in a human rights act you know either aged right you know disability right uh, children's right um, this has nothing to do with Children's Act. Mm. We're talking about like the rights that pertain to them, you know, property rights, spousal rights. There are things that you can put together in one mother act mm. where you pick it and it's like the Bill of Rights right. of Ghana. Right. And, right. and, and, and uh, I'm also looking at the regime. Of course, the victim support could also include, could be defined to include people who are exonerated uh, in court actions. Mm. We don't have any means of calculating what compensation the state gives them. Mm. So, for example, Eric Asante, he serves 12, uh, 15 years in prison in hard labor. He comes out and Supreme Court orders are giving 40000 How much mm. is 40000 mm. mm. So somebody who has spent all his, I mean, uh, uh, 15 years in jail, he was a teacher, he's written books, he would have advanced in life. But it's because we don't have a guide. If mm. we had a guide, that says that uh, for every day in prison or for every hour spent in prison, the state is oh, supposed to be paying you a dollar, two dollar, mm. to three dollars, or uh, ten dollars, or no, I'm even quoting in dollars, maybe a hundred Ghana, two hundred Ghana, or something. Mm. Then everybody knows. So even when the police is unlawfully detaining somebody, you start counting the the damage, the cost, the to, cost the to the state. And you know what? It will be so easy now to surcharge police officers mm. because the act will now deter the circumstance under which you can even surcharge people who wrongfully detain people. Mm including judges who wrongfully convict people. I see. You it's know, so done. that is going to make everybody cautious and, and it's going to clean up the system. You know, right now we don't have any victim protection, you know, regime. Mm. So these are things I'm, I, I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, but definitely I'm working with other consultants. We're looking and at other, colleagues in parliament looking at other, other jurisdictions to see how it's going so that we can be able to introduce the private members bill and, and, and make some case for, for all these people in, in, you know, in, in, in Ghana. And then there's an aspect of people who are kept on remand and finally released from remand. And there's nothing for them. Mm -hmm. Why must you keep somebody on remand for like four years, five years? You release them and you, they must now come back to court for an action before they are compensated. That is completely... I mean, high part, sense the of, system should be able to correct the system should be able to without develop, being prompted to you know right. processes of compensation people medical negligence type some types of medical negligence and uh, you are, your negligence leads to death mm. and now the person needs to now look for money to look for lawyers to go to court mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. compensation why can't we have medical negligence bill mm. Mm. introduced where it is so clear the type of negligence, the aggravation levels, what can be described as what, and what kind of compensation regimes go with them. Those things would almost automatically regularize our system to a very large extent. And I'm looking forward to things like that in Parliament. I believe there are new values that can be added to the work you already. You add a lot of value to yeah. Parliament. Are you yeah. looking forward to any particular committees? Not really. You know, um, Committees sometimes, even though they are based on competencies. Which committee is your mentor on? 
Oh, I really know that you just really want me to give away my <laughs> mentor on this show. Um, I mean, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, I, I believe that my abilities will give me a chance to serve on myriads of Those committees. Um, having sociology as a background, um, before the law, uh, did an LLM in oil and gas law, uh, having a master's program in economic policy management from the Department of Economics, um, before man. you know, doing a number of things, human rights and peace conflict studies, uh, MFA program, and so I believe that I have positioned myself to put my service available to the nation mm. at any mm. level mm. that uh, maybe both my men mentors and people who may be guiding me in parliament will be suggesting that I do, and I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to humble myself and uh, those who have taken the lead uh, so that I don't make mistakes that they made. I want to learn so I will not make mistakes that others made. There's a lot of conversation you know? around a hung parliament. Um, well, that is possible if our case, for example, these five other seats that we've been pushing for, uh, if we're able to recollate the Chimasa, we believe that we won that seat because we have the pink sheets. That shows that we have won. I said that EC claims they've declared something. And what did they declare? Let's see today. They said they don't have it. That's why how strange the whole thing is looking. So you know, but so until it's proven. Well, I mean, if they don't have it, I believe that the best would be to recall it. You know, even though the fact is that because they've declared, we probably may need a court order to recall it. Mm. You know, and so I know that various options are being considered by the party and work is still ongoing. Uh -huh. um, even parliament assistance now. It's definitely not going to be easy for even any of the political parties, you see, because the constitution re re requires that about 50 percent of ministers must come from parliament. Mm. And if ministers are from parliament, the ministers will be embarking on ministerial assignments, traveling, hosting people and doing all that. So they would not always get a chance to be in parliament. Mm -hmm. You know, There's and so, time for their parliamentary you know, duties. activities and all that. And what that means is that, um, I mean, if, God forbid, but if we still remain, I mean, like, I don't even see us, we are not even a ma minority, because it is now, it's like, it's like a, a balanced parliament, you know, because you have equal numbers, because the independent candidate is an independent candidate mm -hmm. who is in parliament. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. so, who considers himself yeah, very yeah, MPPs. Yeah, you know, because, and the constitution requires that the majority is the one that will propose. So you can't say mm -hmm. that you are, so it's still a hung parliament as it is now. You see, because it's like 50 50. You know, Apai, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> how, that, that's what is happening right now. Apai, oh, oh, Apai. Francis, closing remarks yes. to the people of Medina, to Ghana. Um, I want to appreciate the people of Medina. Uh, I appreciate His Excellency John Dramani Mahama for his leadership uh, and what he stands for, um, and want to assure him that. We would continue to support him in any decision he takes, uh, particularly in this time where we are contesting uh, the results of the presidential elections. I want to say a big thank you to Madina, uh, who gave me an overwhelming endorsement and gave His Excellency John Dramani Mahama to an overwhelming endorsement. I want to thank the chiefs. I want to thank uh, my taxi ranks, all the taxi ranks, uh, lorry stations in Madina. Thank you for coming out to vote for me the Trotro stations, my market women, all bases in Medina Zungu, and um, all the bases that I visited during my tour, I appreciate all of you. I'll be coming around all the churches, the mosques, the imams, the pastors, the, all of you who stood for me, prayed for me, assisted me, voted for me, and for even those who did not vote for me, I am so grateful. I will be an MP for all of us. MPP, NDC, CPP, whoever you belong to, uh, Lawyer Susu would work for all of you without discrimination. And my programs and projects is going to be for all of you. Ghana, if there is anyone out there who has given up on politics, who has given up on politicians, mm. I want you to watch me carefully, watch my life carefully, watch my values carefully, watch my services carefully, watch my parliamentary representation carefully, and you would realize that there is still hope for the future of Ghana when it comes to young men entering into politics and into leadership. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you so much, uh, Loya Susu. And I, Noam Falong, I want to thank you 
our viewers for constantly sticking with Spotlight as we consistently bring you relevant conversations. Join us again, same time, Wednesday, 8.30 p.m. My name is Nuong Falong. Good evening. Thank you.